hit the record here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and, and Pat is going to go over the USAS portion first. Then I will cover the payroll portion. And Michelle, I believe, is on. Uh, let's see. Yes, she, she is. will be. Okay, yes, she okay. is. I just want to make sure. And she will be covering the inventory portion. So with further ado, without further ado, let's go ahead and Pat, go ahead and get started. Okay, so starting on the wiki page, we'll have this recorded where you signed in under the meetings and trainings page under here. But what we're going to be covering is these release caps down below for September starting with USAS. And remember, these links will take you to the release notes for more detail. But this is like the recap. So one of the bug fixes in USAS, um, in one of the, we had two releases, 8.55 and 8.56. And one of them fixed that internal error that some users occasionally got when they did a process like converting requisitions to purchase orders or the process of converting the payables to disbursements. This didn't happen often, but it was off. It was like the two processes were trying to compete to see which one um, completed. So hopefully that internal error is gone. Another improvement included um, both USAS and USPS, and it's been updated to work with the Duo Security Universal Prompt. Um, there are some properties like behind the scenes in the environment to you to set up, and that can be um, sorry, I got the you can click on here for the integration guide for more information. But if you're hosted with the management council and using the Tanzu environment, then you can also. USPS has a screenshot down below. In the VRA, you can find this to help um, in, uh, help set up the Duo security. So then on the user, in both systems, under system user, we now have a new field. down here that um, will be checked to indicate that it's the dual two-factor authentication once it's been set up correctly. And to get to that point, we do have this um, mass change definition that's been provided in the release notes for both USPS and USAS um, to help with that. Um, to quickly set the flag for the multiple users instead of doing it one by one. And then another improvement was to remove that obs obsolete void old checks option from the uh, disbursement resequence. I have a screenshot of the before and after. Before it included that, and now it looks like this. <laughs> And then we had some 1099 improvements. So I'm gonna go into the system to show you. Under the periodic and 1099 extracts. Now this is set up for this district to submit their own. Um, we now have the printer sealer copies. You see that, remember, these won't darken or be available until you choose one of these forms and then they get darker. Another update was, and if you recall, I think I was on the training where this button went from generate to generate 1099 submission file. And I had mentioned it was gonna go back to generate. And now it did because it, it doesn't just generate the submission file, it generates these copies as well. So let's see, let me check my notes. If you check both types of return and there are none, then it will print a result 
file that says no, no forms. And I don't, in this instance, I don't have any for uh, miscellaneous. So I'm gonna generate it. You see the two files down below that has been generated, one for the non-employment and one for M, uh, miscellaneous. Here's the NEC forms. And since I had no miscellaneous set up, I, get, I still get a file that says no results. So that's kind of nice to let the user know. Um, no matter how like the vendor is set up, like um, lowercase letters or a mixture of capital and lower, it will all print, where's that file, in capital letters. It'll automatically do that now. And another uh, improvement was in the at return address. This was uh, the return address is, was reformatted so it allowed more space, as well as the payer's um, address will now only accept um, 45 characters. And this was, these adjustments were just to get the form to look good on, on, in the allowable space on the printed documents. And then one other thing in the, in the instance, when you, um, if you have a correction form, down here is where you choose whether it's a test correction or original. What now, once you, uh, click on correction, you see that this has been populated so that if you check it, it will help the user um, put in all zeros for the, to help populate the correcting file that you are generating. Any questions on the 1099s? The only other thing that we had on the USAS side was a patch for one district that was related to that void old checks bug. So that didn't impact anyone but that one district. All right, so if there's no questions, I thank you. And now Lori will give you the updates on the USPS side. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen set up here. All right, now, maybe. There it goes. Kind of slow this morning. Tired on a Friday. All right, so we're gonna now go over the payroll portion, the payroll releases for September. And we had two regular releases and one hotfix release. Um, we did have a bug fix. So that was released out on the 674.1. And what that was is it was uh, correcting an issue uh, with the auditor of, auditor of state employee report. There was a problem with um, import and imported data and there were no hours and day value on the uh, compensation record. So it caused a problem. So we did a, a correction to fix that problem and we released that hot fix on September 13th. Uh, we had some improvements, and I will go ahead and show you one of those improvements. One of them was um, have a better error message when there's a duplicate, duplicate check number trying to be used when processing for payroll or for um, uh, outstanding payables. So I'll just go out here to outstanding payables. And I'm going to try to use a duplicate check number, a check number that's already out there to pick, make a payment. So I'll just go in and select this item and do a post. And I'm going to type in the, uh, the, the duplicate check number down here. Three. 
when I try to post that, I get this nice little error message telling me that the dupe, there's a duplicate check already posted for that number telling me, hey, can't use that number, you gotta use a different number. So if you have districts that manually enter in their check numbers, they're gonna probably get this error message if they have a duplicate. Normally, the next available check number already uh, come, is processed on the screen or on the, on the payroll um, pay processing screen. But if they manually would type in a number, it if it's a duplicate, it will give them that new error. All right, back to the recap here. Um, another improvement that we made is we added the employee name to the payroll error report. And in the meantime, when we did that, we also made it. So I think it, I think it looks a lot better because it's got, you know, every other line is shaded and it, it just appears like it's so much easier to read. So I'm just gonna show you a quick uh, sample of that. Pull it up here. And you can see it is just so much easier, you know, with, with the shaded lines and then a, a regular line. It makes it a lot easier. I think it looks cleaner and a little bit nicer. So that is one nice feature that they added. Um, another one that we added, we had a request for this and we, we added it as well as on the employee dashboard. Just pull up somebody here. We added the phone number, numbers, I should say. And when we added the phone numbers, we also have the label. So if, if they're on their employee record, they have the work number defined or the work number entered as well as the home number. Both of those will be now be listed on the employee dashboard with the, the correct labels defined. And if they have the um, unlisted box checked on the employee record for the phone numbers, nothing will show up on the employee dashboard. The phone numbers will not, will not appear on the dashboard. All right, um, another really nice new feature that we added is, is called specific payroll account option out under configuration. So they go here and go down to this, is a specific account search limit uh, configuration. And what this is doing, it will actually, when, when you go into that configuration, it's already defaulted to limit account search. So what the, that limit account search means is if that is checked, when an employee, the payroll person goes out, let's just say they're going into future to add a specific miscellaneous pay account. Well, previously in the past, Every expenditure account that was available was showing up when they're trying to add a, a, a specific miscellaneous pay account. <clears throat> well, now, since that box is checked, what will happen if they are using the magnifying glass, basically searching for a, an expenditure account, all they're going to see are any accounts that have the 100 object codes defined. They will not see the benefit account, the 200 object codes or any other object code that's available out in expenditure accounts because there was a lot of problems with errors being made. They were selecting the wrong accounts. Um, so this should hopefully eliminate some of that problem. Um, if for some reason they want to see all the uh, expenditure accounts, there is an include all accounts option that they can check. Then you can see it changes all of the object Codes. It puts every object code available out there, the 200s, I think I saw 500, 400, yeah, they're all available. But if that box is checked, default, like I said, defaulted, only the 100 object codes are going to appear. Now, if I go in and uncheck that box, the opposite happens. All accounts are going to show. You just click that and we'll uncheck it, save it. We'll go back out to future. And this works in future and current, just so you know, it, it, it works in both places. Um, I'll go ahead and click on the box here. And you can see 
up here it says include all accounts is uh, the box is checked. But if I uncheck it, because right now we're looking at every account because that box is unchecked in the configuration record. So if I uncheck the include all accounts, then you'll see I can only see the 100 object codes. So that's a new feature that we added and hopefully it will help eliminate some of the, some of the problems that districts were experiencing as far as accounts uh, being charged incorrectly. Um, Pat talked about the new dual security integration. And again, the same thing holds true for payroll. Um, if they, if the, your uh, ITC or your district is using the management council, um, if they're hosted with the management council, then they will see that installed dual MFA option available out there. And then um, same thing applies under the user, like Pat showed you. We have that same thing as far as the, uh, the dual integration. Let me go back here, show you that. Two-factor authentication, same thing. And the same thing, it works the same way in payroll if they wanted to mass change and make everyone's flags, uh, check everyone's flags for that two, that option. You have this enable two-factor authentication under the mass change option. So again, both sides have the same, same process available. And I think that is everything that I have for payroll. So if Michelle wants to hop on, she can go ahead and start the inventory releases. Anybody have any questions about anything that was released for the payroll? Okay, Michelle, go ahead and hop on. For some reason, we can't hear you. Yeah, we're not hearing Michelle, she's talking. Can you hear me? Yes. We hear you now. Sorry about that. All right, let me start over. Um, for inventory for the month of September, we had two releases and a hot fix. Um, and so I'm just going to cover some of the bugs and then get into um, some of the improvements. Um, with the bug fixes, um, we did have when migrating um, the import, you know, when it's importing over those extract files from classic, um, we were having some issues with tag numbers that had lowercase letters in them. And so um, that has been fixed now that it forces everything to come over in uppercase. As to how those lowercase letters got in the tag numbers is anybody's guess, because if you try to enter a tag in Classic, it forces everything to be uppercase. So I don't know if it was a load or something that caused that, um, but we've got that fixed now so that the item, it's related acquisition, if it has a disposition, a transfer, um, and it has characters in it, they all come over as uppercase. Um, it was calling causing some balancing issues because it wouldn't it would bring over maybe the item but not bring over the acquisition because um, the item record the um, case it was this it was sensitive to the actual case of it so um, so that's been resolved um, with reports um, I know we still have um, a lot of sort subtotal options and stuff that need to be fixed. And um, I know the auditors are coming in there now trying to run things a certain way. So we are very aware of that and trying to get those out um, as soon as we can. Um, but um, one thing that we did correct here in September was correcting the book value report. Um, the exclude parameters um, were, weren't handling things properly. So we did get that fixed. And all of these other book value um, tickets that have come in regarding they can't sort by fund and function, we have JIRA issues for that, and the developers are working on that. So hopefully, 
um, some of those other issues will be addressed here and fixed here within the next release or two. Um, we corrected some capitalization um, issues that we were having. The first one um, corrected the cap flag um, for when an acquisition was added to an existing item. If the item was, let's say, non-capitalized and they added an additional acquisition onto that item that now made it capitalized, it wasn't showing it as capitalized um, on the grid. So we uh, fixed that so that it does. Also correcting the capitalization for items that, that meet both the dollar and life limit. We had some issues where if a district had both the dollar and life limit, um, it wasn't updating the capitalization status when a new acquisition was added or updated. Um, and so we have fixed that as well um, so that those do show as capitalized now. And I believe on that release, we said, um, if you do have any districts that um, do not have items that, um, uh, that they aren't marked as capitalized, but they should be, um, then you can run that, or they can run that capitalization criteria option under the system menu to get those back to a capitalized status. It's just gonna change the status back to capitalized. Um, and then the last bug fix we had in September um, was the error messages that were being displayed when trying to pull from USAS. Um, they weren't very user-friendly. So we've uh, fixed those um, so that they make a bit more sense now um, to say that, you know, date cannot be blank or something like that. It just has a more user-friendly message as to why maybe something didn't get pulled into the pending file. All right. Any questions on that? Okay, so the improvements that we had. Um, yeah, we do, I'm, I'm sorry, we do have a question about, it looks like back to you, Saz. Maybe we can answer that right now. Sorry, I just happened to see it pop out. How is the fix going to, going for the carryover encumbrance issue? Do you have SASR 5048? What is the projected date for that fix implementation? Uh, I, um, if Pat, I mean, if you guys could take a look at that to see if we have a projected date for that, I don't know that offhand. Actually, I can definitely chime in on this one. This Thank was you. being tested this week, and um, I believe it is on track for the release that's set to come out today. Awesome. So it's the current, yeah, the current release. So it'll be out soon. Okay. Thank you. Um, improvements. Um, I'm going to switch over to where um, some of these improvements are located. So I'm gonna go into my instance here. And one of the first ones that's listed here for improvements is a new depreciation report we put out there. You know, these last few releases, we've been trying to get all the fiscal year and reports out there that are needed. And the EIS closed program in, in uh, EIS, um, it allowed them to generate two reports. It allowed them to generate a depreciation report and a closing report. Those got those were generated automatically. And so we added the close report back in August. And those reports in classic were generated when you ran the EIS close. So when you closed um, for the year. Now in redesign, we don't have like a program that closes. We've got um, fiscal years that we open and close, right? So um, when you close the fiscal year, um, it's going to generate the report bundle, but those reports don't get automatically generated at that time, but you can run them before you close. And so um, the uh, reports are located underneath the report menu. And the one report that was done back in August that replaced the EIS closed.txt report was the fiscal year ending balances report. Well, the one that we just put back or just put out here in September is the depreciation posting report. So that's the replacement for the EIS DEP.txt file that was created in EIS close and classic. Um, so that is going to include 
both the capitalized and non-capitalized items depreciation amounts um, for the year that is going to be closed. So it's more of a projection report, if you will, based on you know where you're currently at um, in their inventory. So if you've got everything entered in, um, then you want to run that before you actually close the year. This depreciation report is basically going to show you the depreciation on cap versus non-cap and show you what it's going to be when you close the year. Um, the other thing that was added was um, the new migration import. And this is for those districts that are not migrating from Classic. They're starting new in inventory. And so if they have been working out of a spreadsheet for years and they want to load that data in, and obviously all of those items span multiple years, they can do that. So once that, you know, we have steps out there to start up a district new. Um, so to create, you know, the Docker instance and all of that. And part of those procedures discuss the uh, migration import. And I believe I have that. And here, here's the documentation underneath system configuration settings that talks about how to load a spreadsheet for those non-migrating districts. And so it has, it's the migration import option. And down here, um, we have the steps and how to accomplish that. Um, I think for most of you, you're wanting to go ahead and have a spreadsheet, which our spreadsheet formats are underneath system import for items. Um, I think, and I think for most of you, they just want to create an item record and a related acquisition record. Um, so when you go in to load that spreadsheet in based on the formatting that's available in the import chapter, um, you're going to select the item import and it will load that spreadsheet in and you want to make sure that if you're just wanting to create an automatic acquisition against that item, every item needs an acquisition, um, you want to you know, make sure that that's checkmarked and the create acquisition records. And when you click on import, then it'll go out there and it will create all of those items from those multiple years on there, as well as its related acquisition record. So that's how that's going to show up. So once you're done um, importing that in, you can go in and view those item records on the items grid and view those acquisition records, related acquisition records on the acquisition grid. Now, I know some um, have asked, so what happens if I don't put anything in core ahead of time, like the locations and the fund and the functions, that's okay. Those will get created automatically. So you can go into core too after you import that spreadsheet and see all those. The only thing it doesn't do because it can't is create the descriptions, right? The descriptions are not on, on the um, spreadsheet file. So those would have to get entered in. Now, when you're talking a fund, function, item categories, probably don't have that many. So it'd be easy just to go into core and edit those and add the descriptions. But when you're talking locations, um, the only thing that the easiest thing that I can recommend is to extract the, those locations out into a spreadsheet, enter in the descriptions, and then import, the, import them back in with the updated descriptions. Um, so that's probably the, the best way to handle that. But how to you know go about importing you know those spreadsheets and stuff? And like I said, these are for districts that did not migrate over. Um, because you know, while it's going in and creating all those items, um, if they have their gap flag enabled as well, it's creating those beginning balances for those capitalized assets. It's doing all that work. Um, so that's all going to be part of that. Um, so after, um, you know, that's uh, one thing I should probably note here is when you're going in and creating that spreadsheet for those districts that do have their gap flag enabled, you want to make sure that the beginning balance column is included on the spreadsheet. 
So if some of you are like, what would the beginning balance be? Well, if you have an item, the original cost, a vehicle, let's say a bus, that's $80,000 um, and you acquired it five years ago, um, your original cost is $80,000. And so is your beginning balance, right? Because you want it you want it to show as capitalized at the beginning of the year. So basically your, your beginning balances are your original cost amounts. And so that's what you would populate in the beginning balance field. Um, so yeah, so this just kind of goes through, you know, how to go about mass importing items. And so, like I said, the majority of the time, um, for ease of importing these is using this. You're going to mass import items with a related acquisition record. This is how you go about doing it. Now, if the district is pretty adamant that they have several acquisitions against an item and they want every single acquisition to show that makes, you know, makes up the total for that item, then we've got other steps here on how to do that. Um, if they want to mass import items with dispositions, they can. Um, and so this third section here um, has the steps on how to do that. Um, so these are basically the details and then, you know, steps that are needed in order to do those mass imports for, like I said, districts that haven't migrated over. Now, if you have districts that have migrated over and they want to mass import a bunch of uh, laptops, then you're going to want to go into the import option and you're going to want to use the import steps in here to upload the CSV file with all the new laptops and import that. And obviously it has to be in an open period, right? Um, so, um, and then all of those will get imported in. The dates have to be within that open period and those get loaded in. So district people can do this. They can go in and enter in new items but when it comes to taking a spreadsheet that the district's been sitting on for several years that they want to go in and create a new inventory with that, that's where you guys have to be involved. They don't have the ability to do that um, mass you know, migration import. You guys are going to have to assist them with that and load that information in for them. Um, any questions on that particular option? Okay, so going back to other improvements that were made, um, we do also have underneath, so we have like a, we have a configuration option under system that I just talked about. That's where um, this migration imports at. But we also have a configuration option underneath core. So it's, you know, make sure that um, you know that there are really two configuration options here in inventory. And so in this configuration option here underneath core, we did add a new option here. And this is really for those districts that are starting new in inventory and want to enable their gap flag. So um, obviously districts that have migrated over, if they were, if their gap flag was set in, cl in classic, they're migrating over with it already enabled by default in inventory. Um, but for those districts that we just talked about that are starting new, um, you will wanna make sure that you enable the gap flag uh, for those. Um, and so basically it's just, you click on enable gap flag, it enables it. Um, and then, you know, things are set. Um, they can run um, their gap reports uh, for that. Um, so um, obviously if you disable the gap flag, then um, they can no longer run the gap related reports and those um, beginning balance amounts will no longer be tracked and things like that. So um, that's what that um, flag will do. So if you've got a district that um, hasn't been on gap, they migrated over, um, from in, from EIS, but they never had their gap flag set, and maybe they want to have gap enabled for the new fiscal year. They're starting a new year and want to start tracking uh, via gap. Then um, you, do, you would just need to go in, and I believe this is a setting just for um, admin, where you go in and it's the replacement for the EIS gap in Classic. You would go in, click on enable gap flag before they start processing for the year. 
and it will set those balances and stuff. So very similar to what we had to do with them in Classic, if they wanted to start up on GAP, it was always at the beginning of a new year and we would have to run EIS GAP for them. So this is kind of the replacement for that. And the last improvement is we did um, put in a test connection underneath pending items. Um, so when using the pull from USAS, um, we have established this test connection just so that you can test it out to make sure that it's talking to USAS okay before you go in and start entering in a date. Um, so it's just a way to uh, kind of check it just to make sure that things are good. Um, and obviously, if you have an issue with that, it's not establishing the connection, um, you know, create a ticket and we'll, we'll look into it. Uh, but that's basically what that's for, is just to make sure that everything's good before you actually go in, start entering a date and pulling those uh, purchase order items, those invoiced items into inventory. Okay, I think that takes care of all of the improvements um, that were done um, in the uh, in the releases for August. Um, I know that uh, we're getting close here to the end for inventory, and I know I have a lot of tickets to get through here, and I'm we're, we're trying to to uh, get through them here. So I'm it's my focus today, um, but um, we. Um, do have some upcoming sessions coming up uh, regarding uh, inventory. I'm gonna go into our training and registration. And um, before, um, we do have an inventory session at the end of the month, and we're gonna talk about the reports and where the data is pulling from. I know we have a lot of ITC staff that are new to inventory. And they never used EIS. I'm not sure what the reports even did in Classic um, to know what they're doing in redesign. So I want to focus on, you know, where that data is coming from. So you can pass that information on uh, to your district. So it's easy, easier for them to understand. So that's going to be at the end of um, the month. Um, the next couple Fridays, we do have um, some intermediate sessions for USAS and payroll. So payroll's up first. So next Friday, we're going to have um, just some intermediate topics that we're going to cover. And this will be a longer session. So we've got three hours blocked. We may finish before then, um, but that will be happening next Friday. And we will have a link ready for you guys too with all of the intermediate uh, details. Uh, we just don't have that enabled yet here. And then the following Friday on the 21st, we're gonna cover USAS. And so um, just some intermediate topics in there. Again, it may be up to a three hour session. Um, so maybe less, um, but we're gonna cover some intermediate type of uh, topics related to USAS. So, and again, all of these will be recorded as well. Okay, any uh, other questions? Okay, well, I hope you guys have a great weekend and we will see you guys next week. Thanks everyone.